Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, July 10th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Tonight. The Confederate flag comes down in South Carolina. Then, white students are told that their race is taking up space. Finally, political correctness warriors want to ban words husband, wife, and have children referred to as purple penguins. I'm dead serious. That's next. Those of us that have read history or read dystopic novels, we know, God, this is like textbook hell. But see, the young don't know. They come home to their parents and go, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm a purple penguin. All designed to go, I'm a purple, I'm a purple, I'm a purple penguin, purple penguin, purple penguin. While we're witnessing a lot of tyranny in the news all of the time, a lot of totalitarianism, but what I am finding so shocking is that Americans are getting really comfortable with thought control. Things are happening so rapidly. Uh, just today, the Confederate flag has been removed from South Carolina's state house after 54 years. Now, this turnabout seemed unthinkable before the June 17th massacre of nine black parishioners, including a state senator, uh, at a Charleston church during a Bible study. Now, this was taken down because Dylan Roof, who was a white man, he was photographed with the Confederate flag. They found these pictures. And so then this reignited calls to have the Confederate flag removed from the state house. So people have been talking about this for years, calls of, you know, this is symbolizes racism and slavery, take it down. But this one event was finally enough to push the collective consciousness of people to say, take it down. I mean, that simple. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Governor Nikki Haley of South Carolina. Quite personally, I think she's a hero because by taking down this uh, racist flag, she's put an end to racism in South Carolina and violent crimes by people on psychotro uh, psychotropic drugs. Right, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing that we point out. It's a flag. It's not going to stop racism. Like you said, it's not going to stop a, a future mass incident from occurring if someone is on some psychotropic drugs. And This is the thing. It's like 9-11. 9-11 sparked the TSA pat-downs at the airport to take away your liberties. This was another instance they used. They took advantage of. The president took advantage of this situation to attack our First Amendment. That's right. what happened. The flag is a part of the First Amendment. Regardless of what it is, it's still a part of the past, and this is an attack on that. Every time something like this happens, a, an attack in our country, they use it as a way to strip us of more and more liberties, and people are dumbed down so much, they're slowly going along with it, thinking that it's cool, it's trendy, it's progressive, it's neat. Meanwhile, the you know gay pride flags are everywhere, they're, they're flying at a you know, beaches everywhere, but that's fine. Right, no calls to take down the ISIS flags, even though ISIS uh, is, are actually throwing gay people off of buildings and, and stuff like that. So it's very selective in this authoritarianism. Um, but the thing with this is like, every single time something happens, they are always pushing for stricter gun control laws. And so, you know, how, how could something like this affect the collective consciousness to a point where people are like, okay, you know what? It's time. Take everybody's guns. Yeah, that, it's fine. The thing that I don't ever understand. Why don't we ever go to the root of the problem and fix it from there? What caused this young man to flip out? Now, if you stick me in a room beside another white person who's racist, we're both white. We both look the same, but internally the way we feel, the way we think are completely different. Mm -hmm. Just because he went out and did something doesn't mean that I should be demonized as a white person and have to feel guilty for something that I never did. Whoa. We need to go and we need to look at the root of the problem, which are these drugs that doctors push, like drug dealers, they're pushermen. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that happen, bad reactions. Because my, myself, when I was in the military, when they pushed these things on us, we all had these horrible reactions. Right. We, we got angry, we attacked, we would fight. And that's the kind of stuff that happens. No one wants to get to the root of the problem. We want to blame a piece of cloth mm -hmm. for this action. Yes, there is racism. There's always going to be racism because you're always going to have ignorant people. And you can't stop that. But we, what we can do is learn to accept the people, learn to accept each other and try to move on. Right. And do well, something. Well, and we know just being under the influence of psychotropic drugs, it also makes you very susceptible to suggest 
suggestion and obviously brainwashing. But now we've saved this clip for you. We wanted to show you this and get your reaction to this video kind of on camera. So you haven't seen this. No, I don't know. I've, I've heard about it this week, but I haven't <laughs> seen it yet. So last month, a liberal filmed himself outside of the St. Louis Zoo. He was berating a man who was open carrying a pistol. And so this was a St. Louis area man. He was open carrying. Uh, his name is Brian Lewis. He stood his ground and he was defending his constitutional rights to open carry while the man filming Richard Johnson proceeded to call him names and he was spouting all of this, you know, liberal anti-gun talking points. So let's take a look. What a dick. Look at the pussies we got here. Yeah, we got a fucking pure pussy standing right here. Yeah, we got a sailor talking the whole time too. What are you going to do with the gun, man? Be an American. Really? going to be an American? That's right. Want to shoot somebody? No, I don't. If someone really? wants to threaten my life, then I will take their life. Nah, that ain't what it's about. What's it about? It's about you fucking being a big man. <laughs> Is it? That's what it's about. Is it? Why you is like his camera shaking? He looks a little scared to me. Actually, I thought it was more about protecting my family. No, no, it's going. not about protecting your family. What it is, you want to be an intimidator. You <laughs> like it when people run from you. No, I don't. No, that's that's who's you, being no the intimidator right now? Who's yeah. being the bully? There the, is no need, need to carry a gun around kids. Do you feel the need to run from me? Oh, hell no. So exactly. he's not intimidating. I don't feel that you should need, to need to run from me. All these people have done walk past me today, and I've not intimidated a single person, except for you. You're sitting there shaking. Because oh, obviously no. you're mad about something that doesn't affect you whatsoever. I'm protecting oh, it does people. affect me. Okay. It affects me. Someone, someone Kids don't to need door. to nope. see a country where people are carrying open f***ing weapons okay. that are loaded. Okay. Well, how about, how about <laughs> Never this? in the history of this country since the 1800s go to, has go that to other ever countries been overseas allowed. Where they this guy carry, is even just women carry. Carry. your typical educated liberal who knows everything but actually knows nothing when you call him on it and here he's being such a hypocrite calling this guy you know that he wants to just bully and intimidate people when he is the one that's going out of his way to bully and intimidate i open carry all the time i've never had one person come up to me scared shaking offended whatsoever more people even go hey man that kind of makes me feel a little bit safer knowing that someone with a good head on their shoulders has a gun in case something does happen some wacko on psychotropic drugs <laughs> like a Dylan Roof goes on a shooting rampage. Exactly. That's why you gotta have a gun. Hey, and by the way, guys, the, the guy that recorded this and put it on YouTube, Dick Johnson, <laughs> he uh, he had a very bad reaction. It backfired on him. More people were thumbs down the video, and he actually pulled it down. But it's still up because we have it on the Infowars side. If you guys can bring that up, it is on Infowars.com. There's the title. Show the title of the page. And then so you can still see it. It's 15 minutes long. There's a lot of cursing, and we're going to show you a couple more clips, but it is worth the watch. No, you're absolutely right. He actually came out and said, we're going to come and take your guns. Watch. You, in this gun shit, in this open carry, is coming to an end. Is it? Yeah. You're going to single-handedly do that. Well, it's a start you're today. You're going to take my guns away. I didn't say I was going to take your guns away, but I'm saying this open carry shit is going to come to an is end. It? Yeah, okay. Is it? Yeah. My dead body. Single-handedly gonna come and take your guns away it's a start and that's what it is it's this ideology they're all gonna it just takes one and then it's gonna trickle down throughout the neighborhood and the community and they're all gonna band together and come and take somehow it. i'm able to keep my calm and composure when i go out and do these man on the street you know and people say really just the most asinine thing yeah but i don't think <laughs> i would have been able to control myself that day i think someone would have been a i would have given that guy some indian burns or something <laughs> i would have definitely put a hurt on that guy <laughs> yeah, yep. wasn't uh, Dick Johnson the name of the TSA agent in uh, one of our <laughs> that yes. one one of our movie uh, movie? That guy was <laughs> destined to be a dick. <laughs> yeah, Dick Johnson. Uh, he probably looked like that guy too. Well, let's just let's watch a little bit more of this footage. Dude, you do not know the crowd I used to run with. I don't care about what. And I'm not a fucking pussy, and I don't need to carry a fucking gun to be a big man. I'm not trying to be a big man. Well, you're here you are with a gun. Rights. I'm 
protecting my constitutional rights. Constitutional rights, my ass. <laughs> okay. Do you, so Does he even you're know? Just you wanting to be a big of, man. How about this? I take your freedom of speech away. You no longer have the constitutional right to stand here and voice your opinion to me. <laughs> apples and oranges, son. It's not apples. <laughs> yes, apples it's and oranges. Right. It's the Second Amendment that protects the First Amendment. Exactly. And it's <laughs> men and women who go overseas and fight for this country and die and shed blood. So your little pansy butt can sit there and do that. What a dirt bag. Well, and hey, that I was just going to say this was right outside of the St. Louis Zoo. Later in the video, we don't we can't show you the whole thing like I said it's 15 minutes long, but two or three other guys walk out with their open carries and he goes after them too. Wow. And he goes easy and he says I'm going to attack you. I'm going to follow you guys all day long and we will take your guns. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Come on, buddy. Come and take it. Yeah, come and take it. Come on. But that's just a perfect example of this totalitarian attitude. They want to rule, they want their belief system to be the be all end all, and they don't even care if they have to rewrite the constitution, you know, reform this yeah, entire country. All these liberal trendies who are always like, I, I want to be in solidarity with everyone. I mm. love and passion. I just care about people. Are some of the most mean, demented, mentally ill people I have ever spoken to. The people that showed up to the abortion protest. Mm -hmm. Vile, had nothing to say. Disgusting people who were talking say. about bragging about murdering kids. Right. Come on, and you guys are in solidarity with what? With murder? Right. Get out of town. You yeah. guys are nut jobs. And then we have the the story out of the AP that there was a gay man that um, carved a gay slur in his arms, and it was staged. Turns out that he did it to himself, so that you know he. So could, he said he was attacked, and that some guy exactly, like held him down, held and down, carved him in, like carved it into his arm, and turns out it was staged. And so you're right. I mean, these are people that they want their agenda no matter what this is going to happen. They want their rights, and they want to take yours away. Absolutely. Total social engineering. Well, stick around. Now, coming up in the later in the show, I'm going to be speaking with two men who have pretty much uncovered a secret police activity taking place. It is bombshell interview. That's coming up later in the show. Uh, but first, joining us in studio will be Jakari Jackson. We're going to look at some more of this totalitarianism in your face. It's happening really fast, people. Stick around. Ladies and gentlemen, we face a globalist program, a plan to end the human species as we know it and make us asexual or basically non-sexual. This was written about in 1932 by Aldous Huxley in Brave New World. He then wrote the book in 1961, Brave New World Revisited, and gave a speech before his death in 1962 that is online. It's one hour long at Berkeley, admitting the entire plan to brainwash everyone, break up families, uh, ban single family dwellings, uh, and basically put chemicals in the food and water to turn us into asexual jellyfish to then be phased out for population reduction. His brother ran the UN UNESCO program and is the founder of the World Transhumanist Society and a eugenicist. Now, in California and in other major states and in cities across the country like Portland and Seattle, they are announcing bans on building new single family dwellings, saying that's racist and hateful that there would be places for a family. This isn't, this isn't being tolerant. This is you existing as bad, like the name boys and girls being phased out because it's hateful and not allowed to be used in these major cities and states we just listed. California has now introduced the bill to ban key words like husband and wife. And they're also moving to restrict boy and girl because it's hurtful if you're a boy or a girl. Someone else might identify as a piece of furniture or transable. This is a psychological warfare program to go out and empower groups of people so their whole identity is this new thing they are, not the Bill of Rights, not the Constitution, not family, not private property. And then once they have this broken strategy that Clinton insider Larry Nichols has talked about, once they have everybody balkanized, they can take over. That was Alex Jones giving us the breakdown of what is happening here, the dismantling of America, social engineering, total rewriting of the meaning of words, getting everybody wrapped up in identity politics and thinking that it's so important. Oh, I identify as a piece of food, a, a dumpling some people identify as, things like that. Uh, Jakari Jackson, you actually did a video about schools now calling kids 
purple penguins and and not referring them to boys or girls because that's wrong. That's hurtful. Well, they don't want any type of gender identification because, you know, because we've seen these schools, they can't say words like you guys or ladies and gentlemen, so they suggest using bizarre terms such as purple penguins. You know, this is the all-inclusive, we don't want to offend any transgendered people, but in the throwback article that I talked about in my report, there was a report from back in 2013 where a young man, well, I guess he doesn't want to be called a man, a transgender person decided to go to the ladies' restroom, and some of the girls were a little freaked out that there's a guy in here standing up using the bathroom in the ladies' bathroom. So instead of asking the person to go to another facility, they said there's something wrong with the girls, and we're actually coming after them saying, you guys are being discriminatory against this man's transgendered rights. But what about their rights as young ladies right. to be able to go into a bathroom or a locker room and be able to you know, do whatever they have to do without some guy in there because right. you know uh, high school guys i could very well see some high school guys just pulling Saying it out the prank exactly yeah, i'm transgender yeah, I'm just sitting here and you're like, not allowed to say because you know, back in the day like guys like drilled holes and try to look into the ladies locker now you exactly. just walk in and put on a wig and hey hey i'm just one of the ladies I'm and yes here. there are creepy enough guys out there that they would do that and as a woman that is my instinct there was actually a, a situation the other night that exact same thing was happening that there was a man and he was kind of lurking and I in my mind I was like why is that guy standing out the bathroom so I was in there and I saw the door open and I thought it was a man and instinctively I just like put my fists up to like punch some guy that was that is I mean transphobic it is That's, wow like the I hate should have is just, just out allowed right myself to be raped but how dare you even react that way you should just be yeah, be, All right, be, now let's uh, let's talk about, you brought this story up. The Oregon is allowing 15-year-olds to get state-subsidized sex change operations without parental But this is the thing. Sex. This is the thing that it, I think is completely hilarious in Utah, because this is in Utah. At 15 years old, you can't drive. You can't go to a tanning bed. You can't get a tattoo. You know, you can't buy liquor, obviously. You can't, and there's so many things you can't do. But you can go get a sex change on the state's dollar. Right. It's quite bizarre because you used to think that they had it to where you could go get a vaccination without parental consent. Now they've kicked it up to a whole nother level where you can go have a sex change operation. Right. And now they want to ban the words husband and wife because they're anti-gay. I mean, it's just total social engineering, rewriting the meaning of things. It's, it's 1984. Now, here is a really hard hitting piece from John Bound. This is the breakdown of America. This is how America dies. President Obama's strategy to just ignore the events spilling over the border aren't working on the American people. Those same balkanization tactics are being used in Europe by the ruling elite, a process of fragmentation of European cities into smaller tribal communities with hostile and non-cooperative laws and customs they bring with them from their own countries and refuse to relinquish to their host. Whitechapel in East London. A hardline vigilante group is trying to impose Sharia law on unsuspecting members of the public. Muslim area, okay? Alcohol, bad. This is a Muslim area. Radical Islamists hate our values, they threaten our way of life. They don't appreciate, they don't condone, they don't allow freedom of expression, self-determination. Anybody that thinks that you should be killed for drawing a cartoon obviously is, is somebody that we need to hunt down, that we need to get rid of in our societies. But the New Testament, we don't believe in that. To you, to you, all you guys think you're gone. That's what you want. This guy's recording so we can hit you, and then that's what you want. So why do you guys pray like this on the bed? Oh, Lord, why, why don't you get on the ground like you're back? This is what is actually happening here in America. But the race baiters would have you believe that all Mexican Americans support the invasion of criminals, potential terrorists, and widespread disease, mixed in with the tsunami of children and mothers fleeing violent realities tugging at our heartstrings. Go to the border. You will quickly discover that most Mexican Americans on the border are more concerned than the rest of America. Why wouldn't they be? Their jobs and hard-earned citizenship are lost to a gray area that won't see the light of day until it's too late. We are fed up, and we say no amnesty. Claudia Spencer is a legal immigrant from Mexico who's now a United States citizen. She's leading the newest chapter of the group, You Don't Speak For Me, which represents Latino Americans who favor border security and the enforcement of immigration laws. My great-grandmother and my grandmother 
uh, grew up right alongside the river. And what my, my grandmother would tell me was when, when she was young, people would come up and, and they would give them food and they would, you know, feed them, uh, give them some water, let them sit in the shade for a little bit, and then they'd send them on their way. Uh, now the same people that live down there on that border, they say it's a different type of people that are coming. It's a different generation that's coming through. Now when they see people walking up the, the gravel road, they go inside, they shutter the windows, and they lock the doors, and, and they just don't want any part of it not because of some sense of country or, or, or whatever the case may be. It's, it's a sense of personal safety. While Americans direct their anger and attention with meaningless flags and transgender celebrities, a globalized U.S. government continues to designate taxpaying citizens and their values as the enemy. If this all appears to be conjecture, take a look at the forward strategy implied by the U.K.'s Ministry of Defense plan into 2040. As globalized international markets swallow up sovereignty, global inequality and radicalization will expand. Healthcare will transform into a global domain driven by inequality. Robots will replace low-wage jobs. The locus of global power will move towards Asia and the Pacific. Global governance will evolve. International organized crime will skyrocket due to now ungovernable spaces brought on by globalization. Frontier disputes will increase. Weapons of mass destruction will significantly affect global security as non-state actors are likely to develop capabilities traditionally associated with states. Meanwhile, Strategic shocks will transform the playing field in pivotal economic nations. The DCDC Global Strategic Trends Program document states, the number of international migrants has increased from a total of 75 million a year in 1965 to 191 million a year in 2005, of whom around 10 million are refugees, and up to 40 million are illegal immigrants. That number may grow to 230 million by 2050. Populations in many affluent societies are likely to decline, encouraging economic migration from less wealthy regions. While nationalism, heritage, and tradition burn in the noonday sun. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, we're all well aware of rampant misconduct within our federal agencies. Just off the top of my head, I can think of uh, the IRS targeting conservative groups and then destroying any evidence of that, destroying the servers after they were subpoenaed. We've got the Department of Justice being complicit in uh, shipping guns across the border, Operation Fast and Furious. Um, former Attorney General Eric Holder was held in contempt of Congress. And, you know, nothing ever happened to him. Now he's got a cushy job at a law firm. So these are just a few of the examples of how our federal agencies are really dealing with their own set of rules. Now, joining me in studio, former IRS Special Agent Joe Bannister and attorney Robert Bernhoff. Now, gentlemen, you really have kind of discovered evidence of kind of some secret police activities here. Legitimately, we are dealing with agencies on operating under their own set of rules. Yeah, that's right, Leanne. Uh, it is a sort of American secret police using uh, illegally obtained secret evidence uh, against American citizens and then lying and concealing the fact that they've done it. Um, what's happening, and uh, we have a case in Atlanta, Georgia, where we filed a federal civil rights complaint uh, alleging that it's the first such case of its kind in the country in federal court. Uh, Joe is helping assist with his experience as a former special agent, uh, decoding some of the reports and and putting his fine eye on it. But here's what's happening. Um, it's taken a turn for the worse, in addition to the things you've mm -hmm. described. Um, federal law enforcement agents are now able to tap into a super double secret database of illegally obtained materials, foreign intel, illegally obtained wiretaps, unconstitutionally obtained statements from confidential informants, and this whole Pandora's box of illegal material. They're able to tap into it and then use it to start investigations against American citizens. Uh, it gets worse from there. They are then officially trained, and we've brought with us to the studio today an actual page from the Internal Revenue Manual where IRS special agents are actually trained on how to fabricate uh, what they call parallelly construct an alternative origin of the investigation and source so that they can conceal the fact that they've tapped into the illegal Pandora's box. And then finally, they're authorized and trained to commit perjury, to file false affidavits, and even to lie to federal judges and juries 
if called upon to keep the whole program a secret. Wow. So all things that if you or I were to conduct ourselves this way, we'd be serving years, lifetime in prison. And these are, they're basically being trained in how to operate under this different sort of jurisdiction here. So tell me a little bit, what is this parallel construction? Yes, the parallel construction aspect, it's an actual official program and it's present in all of the uh, federal law enforcement agencies. Uh, Reuters was able to find a document from 2004 uh, which demonstrates that IRS special agents particularly were trained in parallel construction. And what it means is if I'm a special agent like Joe used to be, uh, rather than just do the hard investigative work to detect uh, criminal activity, uh, I can tap into what's called the OSADEFT Fusion Center at an undisclosed location on the East Coast. And they will feed me data that they think is relevant, let's say to my Atlanta area of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Um, this is all illegally and unconstitutionally obtained information. I start an investigation. Now I'm trained that I can never reveal where I got that information from. So I have to fabricate an alternative scenario. For example, um, Reuters used an example. Let's say that uh, there's a tip that there's a semi-truck driving through Texas and uh, there's a foreign wiretap obtained illegally uh, that suggests there's drugs on that semi-truck. Well, the state troopers will stop that truck but afterwards, they have to lie about the fact that they got that illegal tip. And so they'll create an alternative reality, such as, oh, uh, there was a broken taillight. Or, oh, we saw the driver swerve uh, across the white line or the median line. And so there, these special agents are being trained to lie and deceive and conceal. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've done a number of misconduct cases. I've never seen anything uh, quite like this. It's shocking. Right. And, and a lot of people might say, well, who cares? You know, they're catching terrorists. They're catching these criminals that are shipping drugs across the border, things like that. Uh, but we're actually hearing now they're using this in these civil asset forfeiture cases. So just your average American could be targeted with this and they don't even know how or why they were tipped off or why they got pulled over. And we have cases where there was a young man on a train who had $12,000 taken from him on the spot because he had cash and that was his money. But, you know, the, the cop decided that he obtained it illegally. So now he has to go through the process and, you know, show how he came across that cash and all of that. So this does affect an average American. So this is important. It's not just, oh, well, who cares? They're terrorists. It always starts with the best stated intentions. Uh, the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, which Joe used to be affiliated with as a special agent, it started off to get the really bad guys. Uh, uh, syndicated narco terrorists, violent international drug gangs. Um, and so that's how the Special Operations Division Parallel Construction Program started. But immediately they expanded it to organized crime and money laundering. And now we know from our Atlanta federal civil rights suit that we investigated for five years before we brought the suit that they're targeting ordinary Americans who are not even accused of being organized crime figures. Mm -hmm. They have no involvement with money laundering. Uh, Jerry Marshalletta Jr. ran a successful drywall company. It's it's just, they tell us one thing, they get everybody on board, okay, we're gonna go after the really bad guys, dangerous individuals, right. and then they use that Pandora's box information and they can go after any American with this material mm -hmm. and they'll lie about it. Right, well, I know just for myself personally, you know, years ago when I heard of, of them going and scanning your emails and things, it was to find pedophiles and you think, oh, well, that's great, I don't want anyone, you know, child, passing along child porn and stuff, but it's not. It goes so much deeper than that and you're right, they're always kind of, saying it's for, to catch the ultimate bad guy, but it's really for the average American. And um, so now this OSADEF Fusion Center, Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, so this is, fu Fusion Centers, I mean, these are all across the United States now set up after 9-11. Uh, is this a specific one or? Yes, uh, this is a specific uh, fusion center where Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, and their Special Operations Division, I know there's a lot of acronyms, mm -hmm. SOD, they have a special secret location where they have the DICE database in the Compass software computer system. And this is a special database that is used for parallel construction. It's the nexus of all of the materials that are then leaked out into all cities and districts throughout the country. And this is what IRS agents and FBI agents are tapping into. Um, it's notable that uh, as Reuters reported last year, there was a case where a high-level policymaker at the Department of Justice actually made a secret uh, visit to a federal district court judge's chambers two days before trial started. 
showed him some sod parallel construction evidence from Pandora's box and got the judge to sign a secret order barring the defense lawyers or the prosecutor mm. from seeing the material. This came out on appeal where the Third Circuit Court of Appeals discovered this. They were shocked and horrified, and they issued a notice that this had to be briefed. But the idea that an executive branch official from, D from Department of Justice would violate federal law and go into a judge's chambers ex parte, that's a federal crime, and get the judge to sign a secret order in an open domestic case. When the FISA courts were established, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act courts, secret courts, they said, don't worry about the secret court proceedings. These are terrorists. Well, that sounds like FISA to me. And even in FISA, the government puts a public notice out that they're going to use secret evidence. So terrorists in FISA courts can have more rights than American citizens right now as, as to how this is being operated on the ground. Mm. Okay, now we're going to cut this right here. We'll have a little bit more after the news. Um, but Joe, I wanted to ask you, why is this, why is this so important that we understand that there are IRS agents utilizing this? And this particular document, you said, is no longer in their manual. Well, as most Americans probably know, the IRS uh, is, a, is an information gathering agency, and they, they want to know everything about you so that they can, you know, tax it, tax you uh, not only maybe what you pay it on your tax return, but much, much more. Um, the problem is that this kind of a, of, a, of a procedure, it's actually geared towards taking down a great deal of people and using the fact that most um, cases plead out. They never get to trial where some of this stuff would be discovered. And most Americans are going to be in that boat, wow. right? Like, wow, I'm facing, you know, X number of decades in prison, X hundred thousands of fines. Uh, they're giving me a great deal. And so it enables them, because of the existing plea bargaining system, I'm not saying you don't plea bargain, but the fact that it's so prevalent mm -hmm. to actually help them to cover this up. Wow. And so, you know, working at the IRS so now in the last century, back in 1999, I'm just, I was floored back then in seeing what I was seeing. And now I just, I hope that enough Americans are going to be like, okay, we yeah. all got to get going on this and, and put a stop to this. This is nasty stuff. Right. Absolutely. And we, we've heard of stories where uh, people will actually take the plea because it's, they don't have the money to fight the case. And so maybe they're not even guilty, but they'll just accept the plea deal. Now, stick around because I want to continue this. You've actually go into this in more detail of, of just when they decide that they're going to use this parallel construction. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, that'll be coming up for our Prison Planet subscribers after the news, but stick around. There is more nightly news coming up right after this. So you're telling me that they are committing perjury under oath. Yes, but originally, of course, they said they wouldn't do that. <laughs> when Reuters reporters contacted Department of Justice and DAA people, uh, they said, oh, oh, wait a minute now. If it doesn't plead out, we'll dismiss before trial. We would never have our special agents take the stand, swear to tell the truth, and then commit perjury before a jury. We would just dismiss it. That turns out to be a lie. Mm. And we know that because of our investigation into the Marshalletta case in Northern District of Georgia, and we filed a complaint there in early May. Uh, we'll get to discovery in a couple months. We'll be able to depose all these people. But during this trial, uh, an ICE and Customs Special Agent and an IRS Special Agent committed streaming perjury regarding the source and the origin of the investigation. And we can prove that through about 100,000 pages of documents that we've diced together. So this isn't speculation. These aren't allegations. We can prove exactly where they got the information from and how they committed perjury to conceal it. So again, the government says, well, may, maybe you have questions about what we're doing here, but, but be sure we would never go into a trial setting before an Article Three federal district court judge before a jury with a man or woman's liberty on the line, we would never commit perjury to protect uh, OSADEF SOD parallel construction information. And they're lying about that as well because they do it. Uh, they do it every day of the week and they did it in the Marshalletta case. And then so in that case, let's see, who are we? There are many agencies, ICE, IRS, FBI agents, prosecutors, and a sitting federal judge. Yes, the, uh, one of the former prosecutors, uh, Justin Anand, was then uh, made a United States magistrate judge. Mm. It turns out that all the people that conspired uh, to try and destroy Jerry Marshallette, his father, his family, and the company he built over 20, 30 years, they were all promoted. It's, it's just perverse. 
Wow. Uh, ICE Special Agent Sellers got a cherry job in D.C. in international operations. IRS Special Agent in Charge, Andre Martin, he was promoted. Uh, he is in District of Columbia with a nice, excellent job up there. Uh, former Prosecutor Anand was made a U.S. Magistrate Judge. Everybody did well by conspiring to violate the martial artist's rights. And they all did well for keeping the secret. And that's what it was about. Uh, they lied. They fabricated evidence. They committed perjury to keep secret the origin of the false information against Jerry. And can you explain to me a little bit about the Marshalletta case, just so we can see how anyone could see themselves in this situation? Yes. Uh, Jerry owns a drywall company, and um, he was secretly investigated for about five years. Uh, in seven years after the investigation started, he was indicted on tax charges. They were trumped up. There were no tax violations. I'm a criminal tax lawyer. I know a criminal tax case. Um, and so it started in 1999. It didn't end until 2012. We came in after the trial, got all the convictions reversed on appeal, and then the government decided to retry the whole case. So we filed another motion alleging outrageous government misconduct. The judge finally dismissed the case in September 12th of 2012, just about a couple of years ago. Um, and I've talked to Jerry over the years, and he's a rational, reasonable person, but he told me, I, I just, people need to know what they did to me and my family so it doesn't happen to other people, file the suit. And so that's what brings us here today. Wow. And Joe, is this something that you've come across before, people being kind of taken to the cleaners uh, in this and just getting it drawn out year after year so that finally they'll just, you know, they won't have the money or the wherewithal to be able to continue on? Unfortunately, the um, they were called stats, you know, short for statistics uh, in the government. And the, the better your stats, the better budget you would get, you know, the next year, uh, the more promotions. It's really all based on stats. And so uh, if you have tools like this, uh, as illegal as they might be, and they raise your stats, you're looking pretty and you're getting more promotions and transfers and, and you're just looking really good to the government bureaucracy. So I did see that and it's continuing. It's just that now they're getting even more brazen. Before it might, well, we'll do some mostly legal stuff or, you know, we'll do things according to, uh, to Hoyle. But now they're taking bedrock uh, principles like telling the truth on the witness stand. And you know what? It's bed it used to be bedrock, but we don't really need that anymore because look at the stats we can get and look at and look how many people we get to plead out and no one will ever know. It's a great system. And that's what the, I believe the thought process is there. And they just, they lose touch with the real world mm -hmm. where those of us who get under investigation as I've been and Bob helped me, you know, actually had the resources to, to be acquitted as I deserved. But most Americans don't have those resources mm -hmm. and it is just unconscionable. But all those Americans, before they get fingered with this stuff, we need to all join together and clean house. Right. And, and most people might not even be aware that these type of programs exist to be able to have their attorney say, well, how did you come across this, you know, evidence? Where did you, how did you build your case and all of that? So kind of like that don't ask, don't tell. If they don't ask, well, then they're not technically lying about mm -hmm. it or withholding any information. Well, so what specifically can people do right now? I mean, this is huge. And so you're saying this is probably the first case of its kind that's going to really expose this activity what do we, where do we go from here? This case, to our knowledge, is the first uh, case in the country that alleges this type of uh, perjury, fabrication of evidence, all pursuant to the parallel construction issue. We suspect there are hundreds, if not thousands of others. But as you say, Leanne, if the defendants and the defense lawyers don't even know that this exists or could exist, they don't even know what questions to ask. And defense lawyers are telling me, well, now that we know about parallel construction, we kind of know what questions to ask. But we have no idea in our case if it was used. So we sent a letter to the prosecution saying, gosh, guys, did you violate the Constitution and laws of the United States and use the Pandora's box, OSADEF Fusion Center materials against my client? And you could imagine the prosecutor sends a letter back and says, gosh, no. Yeah. Well, where do you go from there? <laughs> what process do they have to compel on oath representations and statements about that? And even if you compel it on oath, as evidenced by the Marshalletta uh, trial in 2007, if you could call it a trial, they lie on oath. Right. So this is deeply troubling. Uh, what I would ask people to do is just to stay abreast of the developments in this area, 
go back and read the Reuters articles from 2014 in August, from August 5 to about August 29th. They're relatively short. They're concise. Um, they also have published the Internal Revenue Manual section that trains the IRS agents to do it. Um, and keep track of the Marshalletta case. The Marshallettas could use uh, some support in this. They've been fighting this fight for 15 years. And just people dropping them a line and uh, saying we support your efforts would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You agree with that? Any closing words for the average American out there? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, the info warriors uh, know what they're doing when it comes to spreading the word about things. And so you can, you know, we've used a lot of acronyms and uh, uh, this is all new. Uh, I've heard Alex talk about this a number of times, David mm -hmm. Knight, uh, many of the people here. So the, uh, the concept is not new. Maybe some of the details are. Mm -hmm. But um, these people were wronged, the Marchalettas, and they are. Uh, there's a lot more that have been wronged that that don't have the resources. So, if you have a, f a friend or a relative who's an attorney, mention the word parallel construction and have them uh, watch this uh, this news show, and you know, start to spread the word. And I think the word will spread fast, uh, yeah, especially in D.C. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, a lot of people didn't even know civil asset forfeiture existed in that program or even Edward Snowden and everything that he revealed. So that was just a couple of years ago. We had no access to that information. And we have been conspiracy theorists for years. Uh, and now it's, you know, here we here we have proof, we have evidence. And so hopefully this can be the beginning of dismantling all of that misconduct that's rampant right now in our federal government. Was Bob, We're hopeful and yeah. grateful uh, for the opportunity to talk about it tonight. Yeah, thank Bob's, you. We, we remarked about how uh, pieces, you get more pieces to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. now I see how this fits here. And so we just, you know, Bob's doing an amazing job in uh, putting a lot more puzzle pieces into the puzzle. Right. And that's really what it's all about is just shining the light. And even if it's just little pieces, now we have a new piece of the puzzle. So thank you guys so much. We thank appreciate you. it. Welcome back. Now, one of the big words that we're hearing, a big buzzword, you're hearing it everywhere now, is white privilege. Check your privilege and all of this microaggression. You can't even make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and stuff like that for school because that's racist. Some people didn't grow up eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Now we've got a, a racial microaggression campaign. Uh, this is a racialized college group, and they are warning white people that white people, your race is taking up space and silencing others. So they have this classroom where they can go in and, and they have this stop on the door like, hey, yo, before you come in here, check your privilege, white person, because you're taking up space. You can check a person's attitude, but the fact that I was born white, that's something that I can't control. Right. No well, one can control how they were born. Are you going to tell a person to check the fact that they were born handicapped? Are you going to go after them for that? What you can do is you can try to change people's attitudes, but I can't change the way I was born. It's not my fault that I'm white and that some white people a long time ago did some bad things because I've never done that. So I yeah, don't have to check anything. That's completely ridiculous when you think about just the the phrase like you're taking up space. Right. You know, how can you just walk? You're taking up space even though I don't know you from anybody <laughs> on the street. You're some guy who just walked in the class. You got a college sweater just like I do, but immediately you're bad or you need to check yourself before you walk into the room. It's, it's I thought outrageous. we were trying to move away from all that. Yeah, I don't know, Jakari. You kind of sound like a terrorist. Now, this is a really hard-hitting report from John Bown on white privilege and what it's really all about. MTV, the youth division of the government propaganda arm of the military intelligence industrial complex, the very same network responsible for the transformation of a once flourishing free market of creative artists into a homogenized corporate Illuminati parade of talentless drivel is unleashing its divide and conquer series based on white guilt. Okay. <laughs> if you say the wrong thing, then suddenly you are a racist. We've never had to internalize what white people have done in America, but here you can't escape that. You kind of get this feeling that things belong to you. I'm getting uncomfortable, it's, it's uncomfortable. Hey, this is great, let's get all uncomfortable together. Jose Antonio Vargas appears to be regurgitating the work of brown-eyed, blue-eyed, white guilt founder Jane Elliott. In 2009, Karina Knoll of the LA Times reported that soon after Elliott became a controversial figure, she left her meager teaching job in Iowa to rake in an average of $7,000 per lecture from companies, colleges, and governmental institutions. 
the real numbers of crime statistics have steadily dropped according to FBI statistics, but the government brainwashing bureaucracy would have you believe the opposite. And so it goes for the poll numbers and obvious disintegration of racism in America. Now, a generation decades removed from the rampant racism of the 1950s is expected to feel guilt for a past most people their age can't even coherently explain. Rather than accept the government is the real progenitor of privilege, whether it's the prison industrial complex where almost 90% of one in nine American black males are incarcerated for victimless, usually petty drug charges and forced into corporate slavery, or the massive crack infusion into black neighborhoods by the CIA, drug cartels, and big banks. I'm letting you know right now that the establishment is using hip hop to prime these kids for a life that's gonna send them to prison, just like they did with me. Or simply the millions of taxpayer dollars used to show recent presidents and their first ladies a good time, those in power know true privilege. But Americans are supposed to believe that some snot-nosed 20-something mixed heritage white kid who probably comes from a middle-class family with struggles no different then the mixed heritage black kid he is supposed to have some upper hand on is the evil mastermind behind a system meant to keep other mixed heritage people down based on skin color. Here's a news flash, racism is dead. Or at least it's been dying its natural last breath for nearly a couple of decades amongst the common people of America. Sure, it's alive and well within the militarized police and the downtrodden cities segregated by government policies. Alive and well in the rhetoric of the mainstream news media. There are too many white liberals in the media. And the reason they're not attacking Barack Obama is because of some type of white guilt you think your ancestors may have owned slaves. You have no fact that your ancestors owned slaves, but the guilt is killing you. Alive and well in White House uh, talking. Another way points. of saying that is uh, Trayvon Martin could have been me. There are very few African-American men in this country who haven't had the experience of being followed when they were shopping in a department store. That includes me. The political classes are blatantly disconnected from the common reality. Americans of all stripes came together to wipe the scourge of racism from the American culture beginning in the 1970s. After shadowy elements of our own government gunned down our real leaders with what recent evidence reveals as a mixed bag of operatives and CIA MK Ultra patsies. And now the Obama administration would have us divided and conquered. A new type of segregation is emerging. Americans are increasingly segregated by the content of their character. And approval of the characters inhabiting the power structure of the nation's capital is at a record low. For most Americans, things are tough all over, and under Obama's policies, getting tougher every day. The average American sure as hell isn't going to listen to a bitter illegal immigrant like Jose Antonio Vargas clearly slinging the Cloward Piven divide and conquer strategy. So don't expect the majority of Americans to shoulder the blame. In the words of Bob Dylan, a musician from a bygone era when the First Amendment was revered, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. There's a war on for your mind, America, and the first shots were fired long ago. John Bound for Infowars.com. And so that basically sums it up. I mean, this is absolute insanity here. A war on for your mind, but the shots were fired a long time ago. And we talk about totalitarianism in the past, but the new totalitarians are here. And I read a really good article today uh, out of The Federalist, and it's called The New Totalitarians Are Here, basically breaking down. People kind of use the word authoritarian and totalitarian um, in tandem, but they mean they're different. And it's kind of important to know the difference between those two words. Authoritarians merely want obedience, while totalitarians, whose rule is rooted in an ideology, want obedience and conversion. The authoritarians are the guys in charge who want to stay in charge, and they don't much care about you or what you're doing so long as you stay out of their way. Live or die, it's all same to the regime. Totalitarians are a different breed. These are the people who have a plan, who think they see the future more clearly than you, or who are convinced they grasp reality in a way that you do not. 
They don't serve themselves. They serve history or the people or the idea or some other ideological totem that justifies their actions. They want obedience, of course, but even more, they want their rule and their belief system to be accepted and self-sustaining. And the only way to achieve that is to create a new society of people who share those beliefs, even if it means bludgeoning every last citizen into enlightenment. That's what makes totalitarians different and more dangerous. They are totalistic in the sense they demand a complete reorientation of the individual to the state and its ideological ends. Every person who harbors a secret objection or even so much as a doubt is a danger to the future of the whole project. And so the regime compels its subjects not only to obey, but to believe. So guys, what do you think? I mean, have they taken all of this too far? Are they going too totalitarian, too fast? Um, World Net Daily is reporting that the coming era of civil disobedience is here. I mean, do you think people are just going to say enough? These laws are ridiculous. I think we got a little bit further to go for that. You know, you've, you've got some, some small little, uh, you know, riots happening from here, you know, little places here and there, but I don't see an overall country as a whole no. Really, at that point, do you saying, you know what, enough is enough. We got to do something. No, and I think Charleston was a good good example of that because, yeah, we have been to Baltimore, Ferguson, you know, many other places. But, you know, you, you can see that it's not countrywide. There are people who are trying to handle things in a civil manner. So as far as a big overthrow, I don't see that coming. No. Well, I mean, you have the people there with the Confederate flag. They're saying, if you're going to take it down from the state house, well, then we're going to fly it everywhere now. So it's almost like throwing it in the face. Like, if you're going to make these laws and rules, well, then we're going to disobey them because you're taking it too far. Well, I guess they're having their First Amendment rights attacked, so they figure that they'll shoot back with flying them and buying them out. There's been a lot of, I was reading an article earlier today, uh, Storm Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, not that far up the road from uh, Charleston. They are selling out of Confederate flag memorabilia left and right. They can barely keep it on the shelves because I guess that is saying, you know what, hey, you're going to take the flag down. Guess what? Right. And I think that's a, a normal reaction, you know, regardless of what you think about the flag. You know, if you take it down, people are going to try to put it up someplace else. And that's the same thing if anything, anything is controversial. All, they right. done, all they're doing right now is making it more important in a, in a sense. They're making, they're putting more light on it. Absolutely. And I think that that's, it's going to blow back in their face. Yep. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for all the commentary. It's been very fun having you in here with me tonight. And happy birthday to Jakari this week. Yeah, happy birthday.